Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Giluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio, and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge their experiences and their expertise and we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpuli Kiluruma Mohobe. I welcome you once again to another invigorating, another challenging episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. We always bring you cutting edge information in the entrepreneurial space. Back by popular demand this time around uh, is Maitri. Welcome Maitri. Thank you. She's sir. going to discuss with me and share with us uh, all financial issues affecting startups. And you know, her last appearance here went almost viral. It was really, really <laughs> wonderful what happened last time. Uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for having me, Remu Hobe. It's a pleasure to be back. Okay. Um, just reintroduce yourself in terms of telling the viewers who you are, a little bit about your background, and what you do at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Remu Hobe. Mm. And yeah, in, in essence, my name is My Three. You say it is My Three, which mm. is Sanskrit for the friendly one. Mm. Um, you could say I'm a Mutswana at heart because while I wasn't born here, I grew up here for the most part of my life. Mm -hmm. Did a bit of studies outside of Botswana, but somehow my heart kept calling me back here. I am a chartered accountant by profession, so I'm a member of SEMA, ACCA, and our local um, institute, National Institute, which is a member of IFAC, which is the International Federation of Accountants. So the local body is called BICA, the Botswana Institute of Chartered Accountants. Mm. I have over 20 years of experience working in professional services through the big four audit firms, mainly KPMG, working on mostly public interest audits, um, advisory engagements, a few corporate finance type uh, work uh, pieces. And then the second half of my 20 odd career was largely spent at uh, Let's Echo Holdings Limited, where I have uh, many precious memories of mm. building out some truly exciting areas of growth for the group as it grew itself across Africa. Mm. And that was in retail financial services. From there, I was bitten by this bug mm. of how to create the triple bottom line, mm -hmm. right? So how to make this confluence or convergence of capital mm -hmm. uh, come to places where there is a viable product market gap. So mm. it, the capital is flowing to a place where there's a gap that needs to be closed, but which in turn then by doing so creates sustainable social impact. Mm. It's my version of the triple bottom line. Mm. And last time when we spoke, we spoke about the six capitals approach, the fact that it's not just financial capital, but there's intellectual, natural, relationship capital, yes. uh, manufactured capital, you know, mm. and, and many others that, that when they come to bear in the right combination for the right reasons, create sustainable impact. And that's really what now drives me, yeah. Remo Hobe. So I run a consultancy firm. It's Bika licensed. It's called Vetri Consulting. And we work on three verticals, uh, strategy and ESG, which is environmental social governance. It talks about social impact and how to systematically uh, implement that into a, an organization in a way that creates measurable value. I'm also looking at corporate finance and advisory transactions. And then lastly, my third vertical is enterprise development, particularly wow. with a view to startups. And then one of the things that binds you and I together, mm. apart from this common thirst for knowledge and expanding our minds, mm. is that we are fellow angels and mm. members of, uh, and, and directors of the Angel Network Botswana. So that's also something that yeah, keeps it is me that, busy. It is, it is that third, third one, which is startups, yes. that you mentioned, where you and I, our interests converge. And in fact, it's what we're going to talk about what brought you what is the fascination with startups what, what 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 cultivated your interest and brought your attention to startups in particular as a as a focal point yeah mm. um so i'll give it to you from my perspective because i think that's the best way to do it i can't speak for anybody else really F my perspective is that as i shared i'm a trained ca and as you'd know remo hobe is a trained lawyer you know we, we're sort of indoctrinated right into mm. a way of thinking 
a set of principles and a framework of ethics and professionalism and standards. Um, and you know, usually when, you, when you're able to have the liberty as a CA or chartered accountant of sitting at a certain level, certain size of organization, mm. uh, very many very real world practical considerations don't enter the picture and equation. From my perspective as an accountant who's come through big four firms and a listed blue chip pan-African group, mm. you know, when I started to encounter startups even from Letzejo's side when we would say, and I sit on the, ba the board of Stan Big Bank right now, and we're very deliberate there as well to say, when we make procurement decisions, mm -hmm. we must do everything we can within risk limits to give that business to a startup a Botswana startup mm -hmm. in the Botswana context or a Namibian startup. That's, that's Stenbeck's position. Era. Era. Yeah. yeah, and and in the Standard Bank group, we're saying if we're in Kenya, we need to help Kenyan startups. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But let's use whatever means we have to deliberately empower the early stage businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, from where I sit, I look at these early stage entrepreneurs, and I think, jeepers, you guys have so much guts. You mm -hmm. have so much courage. It's so easy to say, I'm going to go through school. I'm going to get my letters and then I'm going to go through, you know, the normal paces that are so predictable. Mm. But they don't do that. Entrepreneurs say, no, I have a vision. And oftentimes nobody else can even put that vision into words for them or relate to it. Mm. And they then single mindedly chase this vision. And I think that's what really gets me is that from my personal perspective, I look at entrepreneurs and I think you have qualities and characteristics that are from my viewpoint, extremely admirable. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, I'd like to be part of your journey and see how I can add what little I can add to mm. help you get to realizing wow. that vision. That, 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 that I concur with 100%. The last time we spoke, we were dealing with the issue of runway. Can you sort of introduce that subject, uh, especially in terms of what, why you say it's important and why you say entrepreneurs should not let runway drop before raising further capital. Right, right. So mm. like we're saying, right, I mean, the journey of an entrepreneur is often a very lonely one for mm. a long time. And there's an acronym FFF, mm. uh, which denotes friends, families and fools. <laughs> who, um, mm. And hopefully it's never the last one that, that comes to play with successful startups. But mm. the idea that you uh, are funding yourself on a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. you know, people haven't yet seen the proof of concept or they haven't seen you out in the market in a big way. And so it's a catch-22, they therefore don't believe, typically. Mm. Um, and so your, your cash flow management, which is what we were talking about predominantly last time when we met, cash flow management is absolutely crucial. And remember I said cash is king and queen and everything mm. in between. Yes. Um, you know, the runway therefore is a product of the net cash outflows versus cash inflows to the business. So quite literally, and particularly because in your early days, you're very much dealing in cash. Very few of your suppliers or creditors or um, vendors are going to accept uh, credit terms with mm -hmm. you, right? Because you're still an unknown quantity to a large extent. Um, if you can get them, that's <laughs> excellent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it. You mm -hmm. need to try to manage your working capital, like we said. But Runway is effectively saying, if I get 100,000 pula in in revenue, right, for this month, but I spent 120K on salaries, rentals, marketing, product development. I'm 20K short and that's my cash burn. And then let's say that was about the it's predictable error. It's the deficit. Mm. Then that's the deficit you have. It's your cash burn every month, mm -hmm. right? Then if you say that, but I've, I've sort of accumulate in my bank account and I've got savings of maybe about uh, let's call it 200K. Mm -hmm. These are nice big figures, I'm sure, for some entrepreneurs. <laughs> yes. Then you say, if I've got the 200K on hand, or it's a line of credit from somebody, or a funding line from my family, or from my previous savings, that's what I've got, the 200K here, and I know every month I'm burning 20. Mm -hmm. My runway is effectively 10 months worth, Yeah, yeah. effectively, mm. give or take. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an accountant, we'd always say to you, if that's what the numbers tell you, be more conservative. Mm -hmm. So maybe estimate that you'll actually run out of runway of cash in eight months' time. Mm -hmm. If you've then run out of cash in eight months' time, you mm -hmm. must have had a, a fallback you know, and a plan B mm -hmm. and an alternative uh, source of liquidity and funding mm -hmm. lined up before that eight-month point. Okay. 
that's Wonderful. essentially that yeah all right the the next sub point which 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 we want to just touch on is um, have a plan to profitability yeah. this is almost like a warning really to yeah. entrepreneurs and uh, can you speak a little bit to how one creates that plan and how one handles that challenge yeah so remember we said make sure that you're keeping your eye on the till and counting the cash mm. and then checking constantly whether you're going to run out of that cash, mm -hmm. what your runway pe period is, mm -hmm. um, so that you can get the funding in. But guess what? Mm. You know, third party funding will come obviously with expectations, right, of return. And this third party or these third parties who then fund you mm -hmm. are taking risk on you. So, and, and that risk on approach for them needs a return. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to demonstrate you will be around in six or 12 months. Not only will the lights be on, but you'll be healthy and sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that actually there's a, a potential for future growth with these partners as well. So for that reason, amongst many other reasons, obviously, you want to pay yourself, you want to do well. Profitability is crucial to be able to map out. Mm. And it's very much linked to your liquidity scenarios mm. and your liquidity situation or your cash flow situation. Um, so what we've discussed previously and now on cash management and runway then bleeds effectively into saying, if for example, I'm going to run out of cash in eight months, but maybe I've got uh, you know an alternative line that I would have lined up between mm -hmm. now and month eight, which by the way, it can take that long, mm -hmm. um, as you know. But if I've got that lined up, then what does that mean for my projections on my revenue growth? That's mm -hmm. crucial, mm -hmm. okay? And then over time, if I can start demonstrating that I'm able to sweat my various forms of capital to grow my revenue base, and we talked about a J-stick or a hockey curve approach last time. Yeah, we covered time. that last time. Yes, mm. but you want to see revenue growing almost exponentially, meaning if it grew by 5% um, April on March, it should grow by you know, 10% May on April. Mm. It should then, keep growing. And the, the growth rate, of rate growth itself grow, should yeah. be higher mm. every month, right? Or every period. Mm. And the point of that is that if you can do that, then the path to profitability starts to reveal itself mm. because when combined with very strict operating model management, meaning uh, if I take your law firm, you become very careful about when do you procure water? Do mm. you procure it once every week or mm. do you, because you know that when your clients come in, they expect a bottle of water, you go to O3 and you say, mm. guys, give me three cases at the beginning of the month and I'm, I'm getting them for you, from you for the next three months, so now I want a discounted rate. Mm. So you then look very carefully at every single item of your activities and mm. your value chain. Mm -hmm. You tighten your operations. Mm -hmm. So you've got, if, if you think like an accountant, Revenues at the top mm. and all of your expenses are here, mm. direct costs and indirect costs. So a direct cost, for example, for you and your law firm is your time, mm -hmm. your billing cost. Yes. Um, and then an indirect cost is the water and the mm. rental, yes. you know, mm. so or electricity or whatever. Mm. And then you want to see that the revenue top line is growing and mm. you're actually starting to squeeze the cost base so that you're sweating the same, uh, I mean, greater revenue yeah, from yeah. the same cost base. And that starts to reveal profitability mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. And that's important because it then says that this is a business model that has relevance in the market it's playing in mm -hmm. and in fact can possibly be replicated with the same profitable effect elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's a great growth story yeah. in short for, yeah. for investors to hear. You've, you've made it so clear. I really love how you explain it. And the, the other part of it is that you, you say we must forge banking relationships. I mean, yeah. I remember a time when we used to be really terrified of approaching our bank managers. You wear your best suit and you, you're in your best behavior. And l a lot of that is changing. But how does, uh, how, what's your advice to startups in terms of forging those banking relationships? Yeah, I think, you know, as you say, the banking scene has changed and financial services have had to be more responsive to the changing needs of the market, more digital, not just because of COVID, but more accessible. That's what the digital piece was about. Mm. Um, and so I think it's, it's very likely that if you have a good equity story, and what I mean by that is a good business model that you've got a track record you can show, you've been disciplined about recording your financials, mm. recording your sales, uh, having assumptions around your growth projections going forward that uh, can be defended you know, based on facts and research 
-hmm. as well as the team that's behind it and maybe contracts and deals that you've signed. And Proof of concept. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. But basically, a bank will want to see history till date and then projections, and they want to see that constant, if, if not constant, but at least then somewhat a growth story behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you look investable, essentially, right? Um, and banks need to take calculated risk. Mm. So to the extent that you as an entrepreneur can show a bank that you are a risk worth taking mm. because their return will never be compromised and their return will never be compromised because you've taken care of all of these fundamentals of the business, mm. it's not unlikely for you to get credit. What, when it becomes difficult is you have patchy information financially, mm -hmm. historically, mm -hmm. um, and it's terrible that we are so scared of finance mm. and recording basics like when we go out to the shop mm. and keep a, a till receipt, record it immediately. You know, when you issue out an invoice, make sure mm. it goes into your system. Um, these things, if you're managing your you know, ongoing operations in a disciplined way and you make it a routine function. I guess well, that's why they call people in your profession bean counters. Exactly. Because you follow <laughs> every little bean. <laughs> exactly, and all I'm saying is that while you do need your bean counters, we're not yet irrelevant, <laughs> mm. we're still not obsolete. Mm. Um, but you know, as an entrepreneur, you can take on quite a lot of that mm. yourself with some basic record keeping. Mm. And that then tells the bank that, listen, at least I've got a, you know, a credit exposure here with an individual or a company that actually has systems, right? Systems mm. to record basic mm. historical information and then also has a plan for the future, mm. which they can back up then you would be able to get, I Isn't think, there, the, the line social, of credit. Is there a social component to this, you know, mm. in terms of snoozing and smoozing with bankers and, and really getting them to like you at a social level? Is that important? I'm sure there's some emotional intelligence angle to connecting with your banker, forming mm. the relationship from that perspective. Mm. I, I certainly mm. would agree with that, mm. but I wouldn't be one to say that that takes precedence over the credibility mm. of uh, your business and the story it can tell even when you are in there to schmooze, mm -hmm. right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so your your business story must speak for itself mm. even in the absence of the founder and the team. Okay, let's talk about debt, debt management, which is the next component. And I think it has buried many an, in, many an entrepreneur debt, not so much because people have a terrible idea, but in terms of just not having the skills to manage the debt. And uh, the statistics are frightening. Ninety percent failure rate for for startups. Mm. How do we? How do we? How? What's your advice on that one? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's good debt and there's bad debt. Mm. And I think that um, you you have situations where it's bad debt when you really didn't need to take that financial obligation on board. Mm. You could have maybe solved for that. So, for example, you're a startup and you go and some bank gives you a mortgage for a huge property when you could have rented the property and you still haven't gotten to that J curve experience in your revenue. Mm -hmm. And now what has happened is you're now contractually saddled with a, a bank obligation that come hell or high water you have to settle. And if you can't, they're going to repossess the property and it'll be in the papers and it affects your reputation and 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 so that's mm. what i would call for example bad debt or it's bad debt because and that's a simple function of timing mm. because you should look at consolidating your business owning your properties controlling your value chain but at a later point in the life cycle of mm -hmm. a business mm -hmm. um, the other kind of bad debt is for example what i saw in my previous life people thinking particularly in southern africa that they could borrow consumer loans okay to mm. go and buy clothes and essay <laughs> and i personally i used to say our agents themselves must be trained which we did do mm. they must be trained on what is a productive use of credit right and a productive you use mean the, of the bank agents who release this money er, yeah. yeah yeah who release it they themselves should be financially educated on what is a productive use of uh, finance? And it's on education, it's on property, it's on businesses, mm. you know, it's on housing. These are the things that are productive, whereas consumptive is, let me buy a TV on credit. You know, the TV will only last me about two years, but I'll take a five-year loan for it. That's bad debt, mm. in my view. And in those cases, if you take it, good luck to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need help then to unwind yourself from that position. It's good when, for example, 
you have a growth story, mm. you can see your path to profitability. So really, you should be at a certain point in the J curve before you seek a loan. So most like what our mutual friend Arun was saying, is that only ask for a loan when you don't need it. Yes, mm. kind of, mm. it's pretty much. And mm. to further what he said, ask for the loan when you don't need it, but when you know that the returns you'll get from using that capital will far exceed the cost of that capital, mm -hmm. right? Mm. And then you can employ, and you've got to be looking at that equation of, by getting that capital in the door, what other benefits did I get? Did I, to your earlier point, mm. form a relationship now with uh, the, the CEO of Stanbic Bank and his head of corporate and institutional banking, where I can now create more ecosystem banking relationships with them mm. on the back of that. Mm. That to me is a soft dividend from such an arrangement that you actually immediately convert into value for the business. Yeah. Let's take the conversation further to maybe the um, you know, emotional intelligence aspect of it because you say it's important for entrepreneurs to be, be ambitious but to have plan B's and prepare for contingencies, reserves, emergency savings, investment, investing gradually. You know, speak to that. I, I'd like you to, 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 to really expand on the importance of being ambitious, of thinking big. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said at the outset, Remo Hobe, you know, most entrepreneurs who ultimately make it um, have this fire in their belly, mm. you know, and nothing can detract them from their vision of what they want to do. Mm. If anything, they'll modify their views based on what they absorb from feedback, especially from sources that have good criticism to give you. Um, but there's got to be that determination and that focus, a laser focus as people call it, mm. that I want to, uh, for example, build Botswana's first, um, you know, totally uh, tech-based agri-food chain. You know, I want to do that and I can see it happening. And here's my first block, my second block, my third block, mm. which gets bigger and bigger as it goes. You know, that kind of determination and seeing it in five and ten years' time in your mind's eye is crucial. Mm. But then you've also got to blend it with a bit of pragmatism mm -hmm. or real-world understanding. Mm. And that's where I, I think even Arun said before that some of his best mentors have been the ones who first knocked him down mm. to size, <laughs> you know, mm. squeezed the big ego or whatever or these lofty ideas and then said, Guy, that's okay, mm. that will come, mm. um, but let's think next month and mm. let's think six months. Mm. And to that point, I was talking to another client recently, um, a, a brilliant young gent, mm -hmm. Mutsuana gent, mm. who wants to build a particular fintech solution. And I was honored that he brought his father-in-law and his mentor along mm. to meet me. Mm. And, uh, you know, before we knew it, myself and the gent uh, were, my client, were, mm. were starting to talk about how this thing could go viral across Africa and we could modify regulations and financial inclusion. And then his father-in-law said, very rightly, he mm. stopped us and he said, um, okay, that's fine, mm. but what's it going to cost? Mm. <laughs> and when, it's when, a sobering question. Yes, what is it going to cost? Mm. When do those costs have to come through? Mm. Who has to do what? Mm. You know? And so you, you, you need that as well, somebody mm. to pace you and say, and somebody in your mind, in fact, you need to develop that capability that says, I know that this agri tech food chain can work, but what do I need to do immediately? Mm. And what do I need to do next month? And what are the preconditions, the you know, things that uh, interact with each other? Let's talk about reserves in particular. Mm. Are there guidelines, are there per percentages involved in terms of what reserves in relation to your wage bill or in relation to your monthly or annual you know, um, you, you know, burn rates should you put aside? Yeah. Are there any indications mm. there? Look, so for, for the banking sector, for example, mm. um, they ask that for commercial banks, the typical, the mean is somewhere between about, call it 12 and a half and 17%, depending on where you are in Africa, mm. uh, that you should have as capital, and that is denominated as that percentage of assets. So they look at your assets and they risk weight them down, where, for example, um, cash has a risk weight of zero, uh, but maybe certain other assets have a risk weight of 100, so they're not counted. Mm. But then you say 15% of the, the, high, the lower risk weighted assets must be my minimum capital. That's mm -hmm. a way of saying what a reserve should be, or mm. my liquidity, my minimum cash should be 
an X percent of my capital. Mm. And so some sectors of the economy do have those limits. And in fact, regulators help us by giving us those limits. Mm. But I'd say that generally for cross industry startups, you should at least be able to run for the next three to six months. Mm. And the reason I say that is it'll take you about that long to line up alternative funding and, and support for the business. Does this so mean that you have to have the discipline to put aside a certain percentage of, let's say, your monthly turnover? Absolutely. Uh, to, yeah. to, to, towards, towards these reserves? To, towards and, and, reserves, And if yeah. so, are there any kind of guidelines or cross-industry guidelines in that regard? I wouldn't say so, and I'd be very happy to hear if somebody thinks that there are. I think it's more like what you can adjust to within that, because a component of it is, and, and that's what we also mentioned there, is um, your own needs. Mm. You have to put aside enough for mm. your own needs, mm -hmm. but for example, you can manage it down and you can say, instead of buying my BMW, I'm going to use my mother's old Corolla for mm -hmm. now. Yes. And there's a huge difference between paying a bank or, or say West Bank, you know, 5k a month for mm. this BMW mm. that gives you fleeting satisfaction and and <laughs> getting your mom's really free fleeting, Corolla, yeah. really fleeting, <laughs> using your mom's Corolla and all you have to pay for is fuel or mm. uh, some servicing costs, which is maybe maximum 1000 a month. That yeah. 4000 difference could be the difference between you making your rent this mm. month or not. Mm. So there isn't really a formula is my answer to you. I think yeah. the point is You've got to make sure you're living within what you make. Mm -hmm. And when I say living, for the entrepreneur, living is the entirety of the business, not what your daily needs. Uh, you, you've got to make sure that the business is able to survive within that. And mm. every month you should essentially target to put away more and more, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, yes. into your rainy day Is um, that is that where you reserves. talk about emergency savings exactly. account? Exactly. And are there any indicators in that regard? or? Oh, it's really a gut thing. It's a gut feel. I would say, you know, being somebody who's been to, w I've been to the Anglican Church of, uh, several times with my <laughs> husband, and we know about the, the process of tithing, mm. this practice. So tithing is to give one tenth, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, at least if you can do something like that. And mm. again, I'm saying, I'm pushing no my young entrepreneurs to yeah. aim for twenty percent of the mark. <coughs> You're not off the mark. Mm. It's one fifth of what you make. Yeah. Um, and you know when you push yourself more so I'll give you an example when I was even just a salaried person mm. every month I had a, a stop order like so one quarter it was putting away 5k the next quarter it was seven and a half K mm. so I actually increased it by 50% mm -hmm. a quarter and quarter and then the next quarter it was ten and a half I was deliberately hard on myself mm. in terms of what I needed to save and the result of that was that when I did take out credit ultimately for property I actually early repaid on mm. my on my loans, mm. and I have a I actually don't have a credit history, so to speak. <laughs> That's a downside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is actually a downside, by the way. <laughs> yeah, in a funny <laughs> um, way. In a funny way. Mm. But you know, so I agree with you. Tw if you can do twenty percent or twenty-five percent, but mm. what I would caution is, for example, I would put five to ten of your cumulative earnings into savings mm. that you just put park away mm -hmm. you know so in a banking uh, in a uh, sort of scenario that is basically the reserve you leave with the central bank mm. you can't touch that money <laughs> you know mm. and that's how you should look at an emergency fund for an uh, entrepreneur's perspective mm. but then if you're putting away 25 cumulatively percent mm. maybe take that 15 percent and reinvest it either into this business or an alternative business or an alternative instrument that yeah. will give you a return because you, what you want to do over time is mitigate your own risk mm. of financial failure. Yes. Yeah. So you need to spread those earnings. I think you earnings. should you should develop that point further because I I'm of the view that investing gradually and adopting these strategies will actually lead to complete financial independence and freedom. Yeah. And freedom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you sort of speak to that point a bit more? Yeah. So I, I think yeah that's. And the reason I had raised that with you was that I think one of the pitfalls I see when I talk to entrepreneurs, who I do talk to now, is that it's the flip side, the dark side of having that single-minded focus. Mm. That you're so into the business, you're not realizing that in case this fails, I put all my eggs in this basket and then I have to start from scratch again. So mm. also having this deliberate parallel track where, like we're saying, you're putting aside 5% first, then 10%. And remember, if you are running your business right, it's 5% of 100 
thousand this month. Mm. Maybe in six months' time, it's ten percent of one hundred and fifty thousand. Mm. You know, so it's you're also growing either way. Exactly, mm. both ways. Mm. And um, when you're doing that, have like an investment strategy, essentially, mm. where you say. If about 90% of my total net worth is locked into this business, mm -hmm. the 10% that isn't, I want to have maybe half of that 10% in something very liquid so that I can pull it out. Maybe it's a call account, maybe it's a short term instrument with, or it's, it's a, a holding of shares, mm -hmm. but you know, shares with a guaranteed return, okay? And then maybe I want to put another that other 5% into a deposit for property. Mm, mm. You know, so you already, if you look at the, if you put... So you are diversifying worth, mm. the portion that doesn't uh, constitute your, your, the net worth of the business. You're already diversifying that portion. And increasing your net worth. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. And also securing mm. uh, and mitigating in case something happens in the mm. business. And remember, a lot of what happens to businesses by way of shocks are ex exogenous or they're they're external to the business mm. it's something like covid or it's a fuel price increase or you know it, or a vat rate mm. increase these are things that you can't control and mm. they happen to the business now you must be able to adapt and reflexively respond wow, mm. wow. all right let's um talk about selection of investors when we talk about yeah. people coming into your business select the right investors this is something you're very uh, strong on that you wanted to emphasize. Yeah. Can you um, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. Um, in fact, Rima Hobe, I had the privilege of speaking at uh, a young lady Zinzi Litsididi's um, hub the other day. Mm -hmm. It was virtual, mm. but I got to speak to something. I think she said about 30 women or 25 women mm. dialed in, and it was about uh, financial management for uh, women-led businesses. And one of the ladies, the brilliant young lady, who I believe has inherited some family businesses, asked me, what are one of the key reasons that if you think back, you would have said no to an investment, right, as an angel? Mm -hmm. And when I thought about it, I said, actually, the biggest reason, okay, it can be that you don't have your numbers right, uh, you, you haven't figured out your strategy, but you know what? You can fix those things. Mm. The thing you can't fix is when you, you're across the table from this entrepreneur and uh, you don't get a sense that they're being honest, that they're even making themselves vulnerable to mm -hmm. you by being transparent mm -hmm. um, and that maybe they feel they want more from you than you're going to get from them. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a financial sense. I mean that in a sense of exchanging you know, uh, how do I put you it? You want people who are open. Yes, open yeah. and, and uh, with integrity mm. and with authenticity. They must be their real self. Yeah, and, and you don't maybe get you're a that. bit like me because I'm a little reluctant to sign NDAs. Mm. If you come with a thick NDA, I, I get worried that this person exactly. is worried about things that are, I don't really understand the business and already I'm supposed you want to, to, withhold. to tie me up in yeah. something I don't understand. Totally, absolutely. Mm. And... Um, so what I look for is the character, essentially. Mm. I think that's the biggest thing. Mm. And equally, therefore, as an entrepreneur, you must be finding, it's like getting into an, a marriage, right? Uh, and I was going to say an arranged marriage. <laughs> but uh, the, the beauty of an it arranged is in marriage, a sense, yeah. Yeah, somebody else is arranging it for you. Yeah. In, our, in our culture, it's the parents. Mm. Um, and then we say yes or no. But mm -hmm. I think in this case, you've got to know what kind of individual you are. For example, are you an entrepreneur who's got a very fragile ego and if you get criticism, you won't be able to take it. Mm. So you want somebody who's, who's a lot more gentle with how they give you that constructive criticism. Mm. Um, or are you somebody who needs an absolutely aggressive, pushy mm. person who can open doors for you across Africa? Mm. You've got to know what you want. Uh, in response to the kind of individual you are. That's why you, you call are. it match fitting, exactly. match fitting your investors. Yes, mm. exactly. And it's a bit akin to your earlier point about the banking relationship. Mm. That's a way to warm up into it mm. because you, you realize, you know, do I, do I like the way bank one deals with me versus mm. bank two and mm. their people? Which one do I have more chemistry with? Mm. It's crucial because like we were saying before, lots of factors that affect the business, the dynamics of them, will come you know from a blind side and and you know mm. you won't even Sometimes anticipate it's a cataclysmic event like COVID. absolutely mm. 
And then imagine if in that scenario, you don't have a good relationship with your investor, mm. with your angel investor, or your VC investor. Um, and now you've got to explain why suddenly you've dropped sales projections by 90%. Mm. But there isn't the trust factor, there isn't that belief factor. And these are soft, empathetic things. It's mm. about mm. the emotional Intangibles, intelligence yeah. side. Mm. But you've got to be able to have that bond with this investor mm. to have that hard discussion as well. Mm. Pay yourself. Some even say pay yourself first. Mm. Um, you know, why is that important? If you can't get a return on your investor, uh, on your investment, your investors can't. And you say pay yourself first. Yeah. Well, you don't say first, but you say pay yourself. I it's do important. say pay, pay yourself and full stop, yeah. <laughs> not, not first. Um, yeah. I'm a believer that you, you've got to already be able to live within your means mm -hmm. uh, before you do what you want to do here. Mm. And so a lot of this is about self-awareness. And that's why I say it's a soft side too. Um, but pay your people, for mm. example, mm. before maybe you pay yourself. Mm. But the pr principle is just make sure you're managing your finances to the extent that you are not out of pocket yourself, right? Um, there's a famous story, again, I was telling you before we started about Ratan Tata. And mm -hmm. um, as he started to go into uh, you know, retirement, he's a chairman emeritus, I believe, now of the Tata Group. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's gone more and more into angel investments himself and he invested into an Indian tech startup called Snap Deal or something, Deal mm. Snap or mm. something. Mm. Um, and this young gent gave an interview at a talk, uh, it's called Tycon, T-I-E-C-O-N, mm -hmm. at, at a talk called Tycon, which is the equivalent of TEDx. TEDx, okay. Um, in Indian India. TEDx. Sort of. Yeah. TEDx is also in India, by the way, but yeah. Tycon is something else. I think it's run by a, a publication. And he and Ratan Tata were sitting next to each other. And he was asked, you know, um, was there ever a time, I mean, now you're being funded by one of the world's most admired philanthropic leaders, mm -hmm. business leaders. But was there a time you thought it was never going to happen? And he says there was a time we had only enough money to pay salaries. Mm -hmm. And we knew that once we paid the salaries for that month, we would have zero in the bank account. Mm -hmm. And he said they did it, they, they bit their, their tongues, but they knew that they had enough to get by for their daily needs. They just didn't have anything extra. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next month, it just gave them impetus to push. But what I'm saying is the principle is, if the business can't sustainably start paying your salaries after a point in time mm -hmm. of some stability in the business, then you've got to question whether you need to cut your losses now and move on. Mm -hmm. Do you know and what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and this leads to the B word, isn't it? The budgeting. Yes. The word which some entrepreneurs are a bit fidgety about. <laughs> First of all, why the psychology? Why are people so budget? Why are people kind of um, reluctant to embrace the concept? And why do you think it's, it's, it's key? Maybe because when we budget, we are submitting ourselves to a control, mm. and we don't want that controlled spending. Um, we don't want the idea that there's only so much we can do and we have to deny ourselves something else. Maybe that's the reason. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think in, in business you need, you need to have the growth mindset and mm -hmm. you need to say, I, I have to just spend money on marketing mm -hmm. this month, otherwise I won't make the sales. You know what I mean? So maybe that's the reason that they think budgeting is a preventative mm -hmm. sort of behavior. But I disagree. I think budgeting comes hand in hand with those ambitious plans, where if you say at the outset that for the next quarter, if I want to ramp up sales by 25%, I need to go on an aggressive marketing drive with push SMSs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's it gonna take to do the push SMS campaign, mm -hmm. go to Ma Orange Mask on B-Mobile, negotiate the best deal, and then boom, that number goes into your budget with some mm -hmm. contingency added to it. Mm -hmm. And now you know that you've got to put that money aside and that's reserved for your marketing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's absolutely crucial that um, that forward thinking kind of planning aspect mm -hmm. comes in. Again, it goes back to our earlier point, Rimohobi, where we talked about the picture you present to your, your bankers and your funders. If you are not on top of your forecast projections yourself and being honest about them, then when you present those slightly fictitious numbers <laughs> to your funders and your bankers, they're going to poke holes in them. Mm. And when they are able to poke holes, they'll lose confidence in you. Absolutely, especially if you're unable to back yourself up. Yeah. All right, setting your financial goals, that's another big chunk of 
um, points that we want to cover. Um, set your financial goals, build budgets, focus a near-term update of budgets, that kind of thing. Let's talk about financial goals and how to go about it. And by the way, here you, you, should, you should really shamelessly plug yourself in terms <laughs> of what you can do for businesses and yeah. what your company can do in that regard. Fair enough. Mm. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the importance of the goals comes from, you know, being able to have a few key indicators that you know determine success for you and the business. Mm -hmm. And it's twofold. It's you personally, because it's a very personal journey. So is your, is your objective as an individual that you want to have your own property? in one year's time from starting this business and as a result of the growth from the business. Mm -hmm. That's a financial goal. Mm -hmm. Or do you want to have settled maybe a loan from your old employment in 15 months time? Mm. And early settle, that would be wonderful. <laughs> you know, um, early settle that. That's a, a personal financial goal. Mm -hmm. And then when you have put that down and you've been very deliberate about it, it immediately directs your mental energies, hopefully, to saying, what do I need to do to make that possible? And it goes in tandem then with your business where you say, for my business this month, next month, the whole quarter, mm -hmm. what do I expect in sales, quantity, volume? So if it's a person who's selling cosmetics, how many soap bars uh, do I expect to sell? How many uh, you know, lotions, whatever? And what does that mean for me in revenue? Can I flex my prices? Mm -hmm. It's a whole you know, like you go down a rabbit hole, basically. Mm -hmm. um, can I add more stores for distribution? Must I be looking at online sales? And then you, you trickle that down to what does it mean for my direct costs, mm -hmm. for my indirect costs? Mm -hmm. Can I pay myself, mm -hmm. right? Will mm -hmm. I be able to pay my salaries? Will I have a reserve? Mm -hmm. How much am I putting away into my emergency reserve, into my yeah. alternative investments? Mm -hmm. That's all part of the whole uh, budgeting piece that then helps you to figure out whether the goals you can set will be achievable or not and should you temper those goals. Mm. So typically, like even in big businesses, I'm not saying big businesses got there overnight miraculously. These are practices that, that should be done at a small business level mm. as well. They're foundational. You, they're fundamental. So mm. you should be saying for the next year and two and five years, what's my strategy? Right. What do I want as a vision to have achieved as a business, mm. right? Which is maybe you say 5% market share and X number of repeat customers and mm. Y amount of revenue growth or something like that. Mm. Um, and those are the long-term strategic goals that you set. And then you start bringing them back closer to you in terms of time frame horizon. Mm -hmm. And you start saying, therefore, what plans must I put so in you, place you to achieve that? So you plan long-term and then you kind of reverse engineer yeah. break it down to small chunks yes. to where you are. Exactly. And then it doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. Then you have this plan for the year ahead, and that's my full year budget. Mm. And every month I do cash flow forecasts. I do uh, expense forecasts. I do sales forecasts, mm -hmm. right? And I, they all meld together to give me my month-on-month -month rolling projections, right? When you are now going through that month that you budgeted for or you projected for, so let's say we're going into April now, right? Mm. Uh, we finished March. In February, I must have had a, an outlook for March, what wow. would happen. Mm. I then compare my March forecast to my March actuals. And I need to say, why did I only hit 1,000 bars of sales, mm -hmm. soap, soap bars, okay? <laughs> yeah. uh, when I wanted to hit 1.5, mm. where did the 1,000 get sold? Mm. Which stores? Mm. what periods of time you know why you need to do that is because the gap analysis or the variance between mm. it's called variance analysis between your budget slash forecast and your actuals then gives you uh, basically the uh, the diagnostic yeah. for why you didn't achieve it hopefully mm. helps you learn that maybe when I projected my 1500 bars I wasn't thinking of something else mm. it's a, it's a knowledge and a learning experience and then you roll that into your April forecast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that learning then mm. becomes intuitively incorporated. And so by the time you get to about September, if you've been doing this systematically, mm. rolling, forecasting, etc., you're pushing yourself closer to your one-year goal. You understand? By mm. iteratively learning and reacting mm. to what you find. So budgeting, yeah. planning, and setting the goals 
they're all so um, tied into each other mm. and they all add up to your ability to achieve your longer term yeah. vision. You seem to be, your approach seems to be very granular, very, very thorough. And there are companies which, which tend to push this to maybe their um, accounting division, to their accountants. Um, to what extent is it the job of the CEO or the founder to actually be very granular about these numbers? Look, I think that the CEO, as they as their businesses grow, have to start delegating a lot, mm. right, to their teams. Mm. But they need to know, like we said earlier, um, what's Im what's really important for this business. Meaning that, if, for example, these three indicators were to be on point, then the business is generally healthy. So, if it's a, a financial services business that does lending, if your um, your loss ratio on your advances book is within a certain percentage, if your return on equity is within a certain, uh, is above a certain percentage, mm. and maybe if your, um, your net yield, uh, meaning your interest margin, mm. is above a certain amount or percentage again, then even if it, uh, around that things sort of went up or down, it's a healthy business. Mm. So the, the CEO, as time goes on and the business hopefully grows and scales, needs to start looking less and less at some of the granular details like rental or phone bills mm -hmm. but they need to keep their eye on the main determinants of success for the business and that they must drill down into mm -hmm. if i can share a story with you please if you don't please go ahead um, when i just joined one of my old employers uh, let's say who i i was sitting with jan klassen he mm -hmm. was the then group md of let's say who nice. and he came to define for me what people often describe as this typical Afrikaner who uh, is meticulous about spending money. And we used to joke and say, you know what, hey, wait, if you want to buy a toilet roll when Jan is you know, in charge of this business, you better be able to justify it. <laughs> <laughs> and he once sat with me, so I was effectively like Group FM or Deputy CFO. Mm. He sat with me and he said, my, my three, I want to go through these three uh, countries, you know, uh, P and Ls, and we had the monthly mm. uh, profit and loss account uh, for the last three months, and then the forecast for the next three months. And Remo Hobe, he took a ruler, mm. okay, ruler like this, and he put it on these printouts, and he went down, and it's about 50 lines of expenses on, say, Namibia's P and L, Mozambique, whatever, mm. went down, and he said that looks wrong to me. Mm. Okay, he says it shouldn't be that because like telephone expenses shouldn't be that because we've outsourced our internet and that's just wrong mm. and it needs to go down mm. so please look into that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i remember sitting there i must have looked like this little kid who was like okay <laughs> but you know he was so very so on top of mm. what uh, you know determinants of uh, you know the shape of expenditure mm -hmm. that this business needed to have yes and he doesn't he was going all over africa and opening up new subsidiaries mm. he doesn't have his finger on the pulse all the time so what will happen is that if a ceo starts by um, monitoring all of this very closely in the first several months of the business's startup phase, mm. then by the time you get to say year uh, two or month 18, like Jan, mm -hmm. you don't need to have been looking at it every day to know something is off from a mm -hmm. mile away. Mm -hmm. And that's really all I was saying. You can saying instinctively to. tell exactly. if something is off. Yeah, but mm. to come back to what you were saying about where do people like me come into that equation? Yes. Um, <clears throat> we would come into the equation because we help you set up those systems of monitoring. And we help you say, listen, these should be your baseline expectations for mm -hmm. how much of your total cost base is made up by rental versus salaries versus X, Y, Z. And you give then somebody like a CEO a high level dashboard view, but it's informed by our detailed analysis mm -hmm. of your numbers. And also, not just that, that's just an as-is picture, right? Yes. We also then say, but hold on, guys. Why are you increasing salaries by 20% when inflation is only about 4%? Mm. I, okay, the jury is out on what real inflation <laughs> is. It's around that, <coughs> that figure, but that's it, feels, it feels like it's it a lot more. It feels like it's 20. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? So why increase salaries by 20% when maybe cost of living increases are only going up by 4% mm. and your productivity is only increasing by 5%? Mm. So we would also then do uh, not just an as-is operational review of your whole health of the fi financial health of the business, mm. we'd actually then say, you know, strategically, tactically, what should it be? Substantially, when we look at it, should you be putting this much towards 
uh, a certain expenditure or so. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> can you redirect some of your expenses? Can you retime them? So those are some of the more strategic and tactical things that your, if you have a good financial advisor, should then come in to help you do. Yeah. And that then enables the CEO to be able to look at the key indicators yeah. that determine success. Okay, you, you, there's a lot of information to process, obviously, as a startup. Um, to what extent does computerization, you know, selection of the correct software, and, and general, you know, digitization of your operations come into play? And are you able to make any recommendations in that regard? Yeah, uh, so it, it really comes into play in a big way. Mm. Because to, the more that you can systematize and make routine these kinds of processes, the less that it becomes a burden and the more that it's an advantage to you in terms of freeing up your time, making your processes more efficient, and most importantly, making financial information on which you can you know, base your decisions readily available, right? Mm, mm. So, <clears throat> for example, saying that you're going to update your financial records at the end of a whole year is a huge... Getting ready for an audit. <laughs> I mean, it's like a huge no-no. Mm. Whereas if the, to my earlier points, if the entrepreneur had a system where on their phone mm. they had something like Tally or QuickBooks or Pastel for small businesses, or even just an invoicing billing system, right? Where once you've now closed a deal, you, you raise the invoice immediately. It goes maybe into G Suite where you, you book all your invoices. That's a system even in itself. And at least what it then does is it caters for the fact that that information is captured then and there. And uh, then you're able to aggregate it and put it into more, you know, But is it easy to get those kind of systems? Uh, I often hear people complaining about cost of software and so on. Yeah, so it depends. You've got to get the right fit. So mm. the kinds of examples I gave of QuickBooks and Tally, mm. they're incredibly affordable. And even if those don't work and you have some Excel spreadsheet skills, use those and you know generate use google suite for example mm. generate your invoices out of google suite and park them into a drive that you've created just for that if you don't want to spend the money but there are some very small you know tools that you can use right now today that don't cost an arm and a leg mm. so if you're looking at sap and oracle you know then you're barking up another tree <laughs> and uh, and honestly even the big banks take Mm. two to three years to make a decision to implement something of that scale, mm. you know, Oracle and, and SAP and such on. So I think you need to look at the right tools for your level of business, which you can scale up and mm. then, um, you know, graduate from when the time is right. Wonderful. You and I belong to an organization known as Angel Network Botswana. A lot of people still don't know about it. Um, some really don't know what we're about. Um, can you take this time to just tell them what your role is and uh, you can even share my role and what we are about and see how we can assist these young entrepreneurs in, mm. in, in, the, in terms of developing our ecosystem? Sure, mm. sure. So, um, yeah, the Angel Network of Botswana was uh, incorporated during the course of last year already. Mm. We're almost halfway through 2021. It was incorporated, if I'm not wrong, towards the second half of 2020. Mm. And um, what we are is a, an association of, it's a company limited by guarantee, but we're an association of private investors who have their private capital mm -hmm. and some time. They've been successful in their fields mm -hmm. and are looking to invest their capital and their time and their capability into startups that they believe have a good fit with them, but also a po possibility or potential for impact. Um, I think, you know, just to put it into context, we're not by any means the first angels ever. Mm -hmm. Angel investing has been around, if I'm not wrong, since the 70s and 80s, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and in that other parts of the world, I mm, think in Botswana, oh, we could well be the first. We are probably the first in Botswana in mm. a formal way. Mm. Um, and yes, we are doing a lot to build partnerships with other recognized players already in this ecosystem such as uh, BIH, uh, you know, CEDA, LEA, uh, even the Stanbic Accelerate Hub, the BDC, etc., and many more in between on the local scene. Uh, but I was going to say that angel investing as a way of participating in the equity scene, if I can put it that way, has been around for decades, if not close to half a century or more. 
And um, it, it really comes from this thinking that when you are a startup, you're, you're never too big to fail, mm -hmm. certainly. But when you're a startup, the chances of failure, you said failure rate of 90% mm -hmm. uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. So when you're a startup, you know, you go through this valley of death. Mm -hmm. And you're not yet ready yeah, you ex for... You explain, for those who don't know, that is well explained in the previous episode. Yeah. You can <laughs> click down below and watch Maitri on the, on the other, you know, Mohobe <laughs> Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. She explains the, val <laughs> the value of death beautifully in that it's show. painful. Yeah. And you don't want to go through that. Mm -hmm. So angels come in at that point, literally like angels, and they swoop in and, and pick you up. Mm -hmm. uh, they give you co access to their contacts, to their network, they help you negotiate new deals, distribution, you know, access to customer bases. They help and push you to grow and expand your business while introducing discipline and controls into it. Um, and they bring whatever talent and capabilities they have to bear into your business without investing a majority stake. Uh, but they really give you that belief and that ability to get out of the valley of death mm. if you ever were near it mm. and be then venture capital investment ready. Uh, most angels are not looking for lifestyle entrepreneurs to invest in. They're looking for entrepreneurs who have a growth mindset. Correct. Yeah, Correct. and so we want to create impact. Mm. And we are not alone in that. You've got African Business Angels Network, which is headed by uh, Tommy Davies. Mm -hmm. It's a Nigerian-founded network. You've got Bansi, which is a Singaporean angel network. There's Wharton mm. School of Angels which is from the Wharton Business School, and so many more in between mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning more and more is that um, angels actually speak a common language. We've been talking to angels from across the continent, we right? We have been, yes. Yes, and, um, and it's just interesting to, ch to exchange ideas, uh, intellectual knowledge, and also deals, mm -hmm. actually to share information. We've been talking to um, Josie Angels mm -hmm. and Abu Kasim, who's been a wealth of uh, experience and knowledge Even for us on how to go about. capitalists like uh, our friend Brown Jesus. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Zachariah George, yes, yes. And, and he's got a brilliant fund. Mm. That's an off-taker from his uh, accelerator. Mm. And that's an important point to make is that when deliberately getting into this ecosystem, I for one believe that the difference we as A and B or Angel Network Botswana are going to make is uh, by making sure that we, we deliberately do everything to not allow our investee companies mm -hmm. to be part of that 90% failure statistic. Okay. And you know, that's what Zach George talks a lot about, that when an entrepreneur has been put through their paces through a world-class accelerator, you flip that statistic yeah. the other way around, and there's more like a- 90% success rate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, as we come close to the end of our discussion, or our time together you get to ask me one question one you whichever question you want to ask different from what you asked last time yeah yeah that yeah. was a <laughs> different one it was more about what what makes you tick mm. um, this I actually had two for you but yes. I'll ask you the first one at mm. least mm. and that is we're now starting to see vaccines roll in although there's been quite a lot of mm -hmm. I guess commentary and controversy and things like that mm. Um, and maybe we're starting to see the beginnings of a slight recovery, albeit not near term, mm -hmm. because of some of the other restrictions. But can you tell me, and this is really selfish, mm -hmm. I'm looking for you to help me be positive, feel mm -hmm. positive about you know, what lies ahead and uh, why I should go out there with renewed energy and vigor. Because quite frankly, and maybe I speak for a lot of people, it's tiring, yeah, Remo yeah. Kobe. There's a lot of negativity and doubt, mm. you know. And I, I just can't, I'm not able to crystallize some real hardcore reasons why mm. one should be extremely <laughs> optimistic. Well, so, let me yeah. assist you. Thank Apart you. Apart from my nature as being an eternal optimist, I go back to history. You know, we know we're feeling, we're all feeling it. It's called uh, COVID fatigue. <laughs> um, yeah. But we, history has an answer for us. I mean, um, the the big one was in uh, 1917 with yeah, the, Spanish the Spanish flu, flu yeah. and then you know they devastated everything mm. and and shortly thereafter was the first world war. Yes. It was a mess. It was but, a decade of but depression. But right now we look back, we talk about the Roaring Twenties. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and then we know what happened at the end of the 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 the, 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 the 20s. We had the 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 uh, you know huge depression. Mm. You know, 
and then we had to have a great president by the name of FDR mm. coming out and saying there's nothing to fear mm. but fear itself and that turned everything around and things picked up even beyond the Second World War you know the, the we call people baby boomers mm. as a result of just mm. the boom that occurred mm. and it went on for 20 years so history is telling us that uh, there's always a huge expansion after a, a cataclysm and then of course we go to you know the big one which was the tech bubble you know the, the 1999 2000 and you know it, people thought it's the end of everything, mm, but mm. we remember the zeros as a time mm. of great expansion mm. until zero eight came, mm. and then he said, "Oh, it's the end of the world again." again. <laughs> and then, and then, um, of course, we know that in America, for instance, the stock market had its biggest expansion even mm. after uh, Biden Biden came in. Mm, mm. It's still expanding, yeah. uh, notwithstanding the COVID situation. So, um, it seems to me that there's a pattern every seven to ten years. There's, there's a huge setback of this kind. Uh, it takes forms that we cannot predict. It takes uh, shapes that we, can, we cannot say in advance, but the outcome seems to be almost predictable. Mm. It's always followed by a period of, of uh, boom. Mm. Already with COVID, people are talking about the COVID dividend. Mm. So many young Botswana have opened businesses. Mm. Some of them are saying, I've had people interview people on this chair where you're sitting saying, mm. If COVID was the best thing that ever happened to them. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as an eternal optimist, there's a lot of things to be said and horrified over. Um, even the vaccines, if, mm. you, if you accept mm. vaccines, because me, I'm a bit in the middle. I'm still doing a little bit of research. But if you decide to take them, uh, it's a positive sign that things are turning around and that, uh, that the future is, is, is very bright. I Excellent. personally feel that the future is very bright. Yes, I've lost some relatives. Yes, I'm losing I'm some sorry. friends. Mm. And it's been terrible. Mm. But I think there's every reason also to be optimistic and be positive based on how I feel as an optimist and based on history. I think things are looking up. Thank you. I think that was just such a perfect answer. <laughs> I needed Thank you. that. Yeah. Okay. And you kind of part answered my next question. Oh, because I, I was see. going to. My next question is going to be, what's your view on the controversy that is brewing in some circles around mm. the, the Indian gift of the Kobe Shield vaccines, yeah. which is not uh, limited to Botswana. They've gifted it to many countries that they consider yeah. diplomatic friends. I think, um, I think if, if one's uh, gut is comfortable, let it be an individual decision. Yeah. Um, there are risks either way. Um, the, the one that, the, 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 the AstraZeneca, I, I, I don't, I'm not, Zeneca, a, Zeneca, yeah. maybe I'm not allowed to say the names on a, on a public platform. Of the one that are. they initially said was terrible, mm. the scientists reviewed that data and said it was okay. Yes. And, um, and uh, you know, there's enough, there's enough information for us to work with and to make a decision. I think there's more pluses than minuses. I would basically say, I'm allowing myself a bit of time to do my research, mm. which will probably take maximum a week or two, yeah. and then I'll decide to go for it. Mm. Excellent. Well, yeah. I've, I had my mother vaccinated yesterday. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. And the, the team, I have to say, were amazing. Wonderful. Uh, at the, um, is it the phase four Kotla? Yeah. Oh, mm. great stuff. Yeah. Mm. Now, here's the part of the show where you get to um, uh, leave the listener with something inspirational. A message of hope um, <laughs> and a message of inspiration. Maybe I have catalyzed you a little bit you to have. say something <laughs> positively. <laughs> yeah. You know, the interesting thing is, while some of us we we run dry for ourselves, mm. we always try to keep something for others. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. Wonderful. So, I mean, what so I go ahead. I think that's your camera. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, so listeners, I think first of all we need to give Remo Kobe a huge. A <laughs> vote of appreciation for what you do okay. you know you could easily choose not to do this mm -hmm. and uh, you could spend your time chasing m maybe selfish pursuits but this is completely selfless in your uh, way and and thank I think you. that you are making such a huge difference thank you very to much. people so the first thing I would say to yourselves is take heart from individuals like him who uh, think of what knowledge can be spread to you and with no ego and completely with uh, total humility, approach people from all walks of life. 
he's equally eager, I'm sure, to hear from me as he is from Bill Gates, <laughs> you know, which makes me feel very special. <laughs> I'm not sure about Bill Gates <laughs> or the other key industrialists in the world, but a wonderful character and individual who's Thank sending you. knowledge out there on platforms Thank that you. you can access uh, really for your benefit and, and no other reason. There's really no other reason. So you are an inspiration to Thank others, Rima and, Thank and you I hope that the viewers when they look at what you do, the body of work that you do, and what you represent outside of these mm -hmm. nuggets, mm. that they take a lesson from it, that there are Botswana like yourself who are hardworking, your work ethic, you're sincere, you're passionate, you're a risk taker. You know, you've got all the characteristics mm -hmm. of, I think, what a good entrepreneur thank ought to much. be and, and should be. Mm. So you're a great role model well, thank you. to them. <laughs> And I would say look for role models like him. You know, if you think that in some shape or form I represent that or another one of his guests does or anybody from any walk of life does, please don't look at color, don't look at status, uh, don't look at where they are. It could be somebody sitting in Timbuktu. Mm. If you think that they will help you to open up your perspectives and expand the horizons of what you can do, that's what you should chase. Okay. Because if there's anything that this uh, pandemic should have taught all of us without exception is that we can't predict, as you said, mm. right, when uh, an event will happen. But what we can control is how well we respond to it. And how well we respond to it is also measured by the impact that we create. So we look to you to be impact creators as well, to be drivers of change and uh, yeah, to bring us along on the journey. All We'd right. be more than honored to, to be part of that. Thank wonderful, you wonderful. Can you please let them know how they can reach you, where you're accessible on social media, and also maybe um, say where they can reach Angel Network Botswana as well? Absolutely. So mm. um, ANB is accessible on LinkedIn via Angel Network Botswana. I believe we have a Facebook page by the same name, mm. but I'm not on Facebook, so I apologize. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, like, I like LinkedIn, it's my thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Remo Hobe and I, and I didn't mention before, you head up mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yes, and learning with um, Guru Guru Murthy, one of his old friends. Yes. So you two are doing a great job to Thank mentor uh, people that come to A&B, mm. but that's where you can find us and you know where to find Remo Hobe and myself. And in terms of my own firm, uh, it's called Vetri Consulting, which is also Tamil. It's a Tamil word and it means victory. Oh. Yes. Wow. Uh, and what we'd want to do is to grow with you to deliver your victory. So you can find me on www.vetriconsulting.com, V-E-T-R-I, consulting, no space uh, and no dashes. Mm. And um, my email address is my3sg at vetriconsulting.com. So maybe you can put it into the comments yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, I think we'll put it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very indeed. much for All having me. Right.